Totila had won two key victories over the Romans in 542 at the battles of Favencia and Mucellium, and in doing so, had rallied more men to his banner. He was significantly undermanned when he took the Ostrogothic throne, but was quickly reducing his deficit by the day. Totila knew of his limitations, and he knew the strengths and weaknesses of his enemies. So when he entered central Italy and found well-defended Roman strongholds unwilling to surrender to him, he simply pressed on south, hoping to gather more men and more resources, while the currently disorganized Romans weren't able to do much about it. He moved into Campania and took Beneventum, and then raised the city's walls so that the Romans could not retake the city and defend it with a small garrison. Totila then moved towards Naples, which Belisarius had taken after a difficult siege in 536. At this point in 542, the Roman garrison in Naples was only about 1,000 strong, and it was headed by Conan, who had been in Italy since the late 530s. The small garrison remained safely behind Naples' walls, leaving the smaller towns in the area essentially undefended. One of those towns was Cumi, which the Ostrogoths took easily. Over the course of the war, the wives and daughters of many wealthy Italian aristocrats had taken refuge in Cumi, which was, to this point, quite a ways away from the bulk of the fighting. When Totila discovered that these women were in the city, and that he had just captured them, he ordered that they be treated with proper respect, and then had them returned to their families unharmed. The generosity shown here was noticed throughout Italy. Totila then zeroed in on Naples itself, with a siege beginning sometime in the fall or winter of 542. Back in Constantinople, Justinian had realized that he had a pretty big problem on his hands. As Totila had moved south through the summer of 542 and captured more and more territory, there was less and less tax revenue coming back to the east. Justinian had hoped that the tax money from the new territory would pay for the invasion and the occupation, but now that wasn't happening and he needed much of his resources on his eastern border. This meant that payments to the soldiers in the west had started to be delayed. As you can probably guess, that wasn't good. This directly led to more desertions from the Roman army. While Totila was moving towards Naples, Justinian was coming to the conclusion that he needed to stop the bleeding. He finally appointed a Praetorian Prefect for Italy, a man who would hold sole command of the military forces on the peninsula. And that man would be sent to Italy with reinforcements and the soldiers' back pay. The new prefect was Maximinus, who left Constantinople sometime in late 542. Maximinus had been to Italy before. He had been one of the envoys who negotiated with Vitiges in 540. He had been a senator in Constantinople, and presumably had a career in government, but he did not have any military experience and he quickly showed that he was the wrong guy for the job. Maximinus made it to the Adriatic coast in November, and then just sat there, coming up with various excuses to avoid crossing the sea during the winter months. Procopius says that Maximinus was too scared to attempt the crossing, and he concocted these excuses because of that. So there he sat, with Naples under siege, with soldiers in Italy still awaiting pay, and with the situation on the peninsula deteriorating by the day. But he couldn't move because cold and scary. Luckily though, 
Justinian had sent more than just Maximinus. Demetrius, an officer who had served under Belisarius at the start of the Italian campaign, departed Constantinople not too long after the newly appointed prefect, and made his way to Sicily despite the big scary winter. In Sicily, Demetrius put together a large fleet of merchant ships, loaded with food and supplies, and prepared to sail for Naples. And yes, you heard that right, these were merchant vessels. Demetrius did have some men under his command, but he didn't have nearly enough to break the siege. So he tried deception. He hoped that the sight of the large fleet would trick the Ostrogoths into thinking that his army was much bigger than it actually was. And this almost worked. The Ostrogoths were very afraid that a massive army was coming to relieve Naples, and they began to prepare for this incoming attack. But they did not flee, and Demetrius didn't want his smaller force exposed, so he shifted north and sailed up the coast. Procopius believed that the Ostrogoths might have retreated had Demetrius sailed directly into the Neapolitan harbor, but we can't really know for sure. Demetrius headed to Rome, hoping to pick up reinforcements before returning to relieve Naples. But when he reached the Eternal City, he found a completely demoralized garrison. Remember, their pay was late, and Maximinus had not arrived with the money yet. They weren't interested in running off to fight, and Demetrius simply could not rally them to his banner. So he was forced to turn back south, having accomplished nothing by coming north. As he prepared to depart from Rome, he was met by a prominent visitor, a civil administrator from Naples, who was also named Demetrius. We don't know this guy's exact position, but it was probably something akin to a mayor, a high-ranking official within the city, but not the man in charge of the military garrison. Anyway, this Demetrius is pretty cool. At the start of the siege, he had actually stood atop the walls of Naples and shouted insults at Totilla while the Ostrogoths threatened the city gates. And he was apparently brutal with it, not holding anything back at all. Like, Totilla remembered what this guy said and held it against him. We'll get to that later, but it was fierce. However, as the siege progressed and matters got worse, Demetrius had to risk his life to escape the city and try to find help. He had made it up to Rome and told the other Demetrius that Naples was in desperate need and could not hold out much longer. So Demetrius, the, the guy with the fleet, tried to hurry back south. In the meantime, Totilla had gotten information about the attempted ruse, and he now knew that there weren't many soldiers aboard those ships. He had enough time to prepare his own fleet, which he knew would mainly be facing off with merchant vessels. So Demetrius's fleet was doomed from the moment it set out from Rome. In the engagement, Totilla's men captured much of the supplies and killed or captured many of the men as well. One of the captives was Demetrius, the civil administrator, not the officer. Demetrius was taken to Totilla, who ordered his tongue ripped out and his hands cut off. He was not killed. Totilla released him, condemning him to live the rest of his life in that mutilated condition. All because he stood atop the walls, shouting insults at the king. As for the other Demetrius, 
he was lucky enough to escape and made it back to Sicily, where he found Maximinus, who had finally been persuaded to cross the Adriatic and had reached Syracuse. Now, Maximinus wasn't too keen on sailing for the peninsula, you know, where the actual war was, but his generals were able to convince him to send another fleet to relieve Naples, with Demetrius again taking part. When this fleet approached the city, a tremendous storm hit and wiped them completely out. Survivors who made it to the Italian shore were easily killed or captured by Totila's men. One of those survivors was Demetrius, who was taken prisoner, and Totila led him, with chains around his neck, to the walls of Naples and ordered him to implore the city to surrender. To those inside the city, this was disheartening. They had held out as long as they could, making what little rations they had last as long as possible. They were tired and starving. They had seen two relief attempts fail. They had seen the other Demetrius suffer a horrible fate. After all that, the sight of a Roman officer in chains, telling them to surrender, was just too much to bear. Totila knew that Naples did not have any options left. He let the citizens know that he did not hold a grudge against them, remembering that the city had fiercely held out against Belisarius years earlier. He promised that if they surrendered, he would generously allow the defenders to leave unharmed, and the citizens would be spared. Conan and his men had little choice, and agreed to surrender within 30 days, still holding out hope that a relief force from the Emperor would arrive. Totila, confident in his victory, agreed not to attack the city for 90 days, driving home the point that help was not on the way. The defenders surrendered in May of 543, still before their own 30-day deadline. Naples was once again in Ostrogothic hands. Totila made good on his promises. He treated the people well, immediately organizing rations for each house within the city and increasing those rations gradually so that the starving people would not engorge themselves after the long siege. Conan and his men were allowed to leave the city unharmed, and they tried to sail for Rome, but were trapped in the harbor by adverse winds and storms. They didn't want to disembark and return to the city, fearing that Totila's mercifulness wouldn't last. So they were basically stuck in the harbor with nowhere to go. Totila noticed the predicament and sent word to Conan that his men would not be treated as enemies if they returned to the city. So the men disembarked and were treated as equals by the Ostrogoths, permitted to walk freely through the city and the camp, and allowed to buy rations for themselves. Totila even went so far as to provide them with horses and money to make the journey to Rome over land, and ordered some of his own officers to accompany Conan's men on the trip north. Totila proceeded to tear down the walls of Naples, as he had done with Beneventum, to prevent the Romans from using the city as a base in the future. Shortly after the fall of Naples, a Roman citizen approached Totila and accused one of the king's bodyguards, 
of raping his daughter. When the guard did not deny the charge, Totilla had him thrown in prison. When another officer attempted to persuade Totilla to release the accused, the king refused, saying that clemency in such a case would actually be lawlessness and that his army could only be successful if such sinful deeds were punished appropriately. His quote according to Procopius was, For it is not possible, no, not possible, for a man who commits injustice and does deeds of violence to win glory in battle. But the fortune of war is decreed according to the life of the individual man. When you compare Totila's actions here with those of the Roman soldiers in other parts of Italy, you could not see a starker contrast. Discipline in the Roman army was almost non-existent by this point. Bands of soldiers were roaming the countryside, pillaging towns and villages, taking what they wanted, and making themselves utterly feared among the Italian populace. These men were allegedly liberators, freeing Italy from the barbarians and restoring the empire. But Totilla was now making sure that he would be seen as the benevolent one. And think of all that the Italian people had been through since Belisarius' arrival on the peninsula six years earlier. Three armies, the Ostrogoths, the Romans, and the Franks, had marched over their lands, disrupted their crops and their trade, and taken their food and their valuables. They had been robbed, they had been beaten, they had been starved, and for what? For these so-called liberators, those who claimed to be their countrymen, to continue to steal from them? And the Ostrogoths had stolen from them too, but now it looks like their king might impose some order. All of this had a huge impact on the people of Italy, who were torn between both sides. To them, this war was a nightmare. But unfortunately, it wasn't going to get any better anytime soon.